All right. Looks like we are live here on Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie and this is Matt. We are your hosts for this afternoon's exciting program. It is a real privilege to have Eric Hoven from Creation Today Ministries with us here for an event dedicated to engaging old earth creation and theistic evolution. Two positions I would call unscriptural and unscientific. Eric has recently uh, debated Dr. Hugh Ross, who is an old earth creationist, as well as inspiring philosophy, a theistic evolutionist. And Eric, I got to say, you did a fantastic job upholding the truth of biblical creation. And so we are going to be focusing on many aspects of your most recent debate with inspiring philosophy. Matt, I'll hand it over to you real quick, brother. Oh, Matt, you're just on mute. Let me get you... You're good. Okay, thanks. New laptop, working off, not going so good. But as everyone knows here on Standing for Truth, we defend the truth of biblical creation, and that is exactly what we're going to be doing here today. So we're thrilled to have Eric here joining us to uphold the truth of biblical creation, and this is going to be a lot of fun. So Eric, I would like to hand it over to you. How are you doing today? Man, I am blessed by the Almighty, just like you gentlemen. Thanks for letting me hang out with you guys for a few minutes. Amen. It's our pleasure. Eric, I've been looking forward to this. The audience has been looking forward to this as well. I'm pumped to get into specifically theistic evolutionism. And before we do, though, I want to give you a formal introduction for anybody who might be unfamiliar with you. Eric, if my Hoven, mom wrote it. It's going to sound really good. Okay. Yeah. So I'll let you know if that's from my mom here in just a minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, okay. Uh, and people can find this on your website, Creation Today uh, Ministries, which I highly recommend. I spend a ton of time going through your uh, interviews. You're always very professional and courteous to your guests. So I appreciate that. Okay. So Eric Hoven grew up immersed in the world of apologetics and following college graduation in 1999, he began full-time ministry. After watching Hell's Best Kept Secret by Ray Comfort, Eric came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ with a desire to make him known throughout the world. President and founder of Pensacola-based organization, Creation Today, Eric's passion to reach with the life-changing message of the gospel has driven him to speak over 5,000 times in eight foreign countries in all 50 states, much like a 21st century Apostle Paul on Mars Hill. In June of 2013, at the dedication of America's first monument to atheism, Eric stood to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to the atheist community, attending its unveiling. My brother, before I get into the first question, again, I appreciate you being here. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add, though, in terms of, of an introduction? My mom's would have been, she, she would have blown me up way bigger than that. So I'm <laughs> glad you just got the one off my website and didn't email uh, email uh, into the office and her respond to that. Now, she's amazing. And uh, it's, it's a blessing to be able to work with family and to be able to serve God. Uh, I, we really do want people to know the truth. And we really do want people to know that the Bible is the foundation. And that's why we have the conversation we're about to have right now, because how many people do we know that their marriage is struggling, their finances are struggling, they're, they're going through issues, our world, our culture, the cultural divides that are taking place, every hot button topic you want to hit comes down to is the word of God right or is it wrong? And if it's right and we followed it, it would settle every single one of these issues. So that is why, Donna, you and Matt have these conversations, I'm assuming, because that's why I have them. Because this is this matters. This is when rubber meets the road. Ah, you got to have the truth. And so I'm passionate about this truth. Amen. Well said. Great introduction. It's exactly why we do this, my brother. And so let me ask you then, which you just kind of touched on, why does this matter? Why do we focus on old earth creation, theistic evolutionism? Why are we here to uphold the truth of God's word and making God's word our final authority, Eric? So when it comes to Old Earth, and I've got, I, I was thinking through an outline, I'm going to be doing a show this next uh, month. I've done a show on Old Earth creation. I'm going to be doing one on theistic evolution. Um, ultimately, why does this matter? I believe a couple of different reasons. Let me actually read you a text. Uh, right before I did the, the debate with Inspiring Philosophy, 
Uh, who was I with Ryan? No, not, uh, who's Nick. Uh, all right. Nick and I were texting back and forth. He said, Hey, I just want to know if you're ready for the, the conversation we're about to have and what, what you think it's going to be about what you're going to cover. Uh, and I, here's the text I sent him that I felt, I felt, Hey, I want to just, uh, here's what I think we're going to cover. Let's see here. Okay. Yeah. He said, Hey, just want to know if you're, uh, nope, up a little further. Sorry. You know, if you're prepared, uh, are you prepared to offer, you know, this and this and this? I said, textual criticism wasn't my specialty, but I do have a lot of quotes I'm prepared to give. The question is going to be, is theistic evolution biblical? I want to show, and here's why I think it's important. It is not consistent with God. The atheists do not believe it's possible. So those who reject Christianity would say, why would you have theistic evolution? It doesn't make sense. Uh, and the science does not show that it's possible. And the church fathers, along with church history, did not incorporate any of these ideas. So what matters is the truth. And as I said in the debate, I wanted to frame the debate. I've heard Inspiring Philosophy do a couple different debates with people on this subject. I went, I think we're missing something. The character of God is at stake with a theistic evolution or even an old earth worldview. You end up compromising the character of God. And if I were going to put this out in a tweet, actually, I've put this out in a tweet or a post, I guess you have to call them now on Twitter because Elon changed it. Um, I, I would say the, the age of the earth or theistic evolution, is it essential to salvation? No, it's not. It's essential to the doctrine that makes salvation necessary the doctrine of sin and death entering into the world. So you really start messing with theology and the need for Christ when you mess with Genesis and try to say maybe God used evolution. So that's really where the big divide comes in is what are we giving up? And, and you end up, and we could talk about this, I tried to bring it up in the show a little bit in the debate. You end up going down a slippery slope and we've watched people go further and further and further, further into liberalism and into, well, does that, is that really what the Bible says? And if that's not what it really says in Genesis, maybe that's not what, what it really says over here. And maybe that's not what Jesus really said. So it's got far reaching results or an impact when it comes to what do you believe about old earth, young earth and theistic evolution. Amen. Well said. It's an authority issue. And I think you nailed it there, uh, Eric. So my next question would be, since specifically theistic evolutionism is on trial. That was the focus of your debate with Inspiring Philosophy. I am going to highlight some aspects of that debate, which again, you did an excellent job. I really enjoyed that. And so can you tell the audience what is exactly meant by theistic evolution? And then we'll move into a secondary question. Is evolution compatible with the Bible? So what is meant by theistic evolution? And this is where, um, man, you, 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 I, I started a, an outline for how, how, do you, how do you unpackage this? There is so much, so much that goes into uh, these concepts. So first of all, you have to define what we know what theism is. Theism is belief in a God. So theistic evolution would be God potentially, and there's different versions of it, but God used evolution. And the simplistic view is, well, evolution has been proven by science, you know, Darwinian evolution or neo-Darwinian evolution proven by science. And so this is a scientific fact that's true, but I also believe in God. So I'm bringing these two views together and saying theism is true, God exists, and evolution is true, things have evolved over time. So I'm going to bring these two together and say that they fit together. So that's the simplistic view of theistic evolution. But but then you got to ask a bunch of questions to really start to understand what is this really? Because, okay, which God? Theistic God. Okay, well, are we talking about the God of the Bible? Because that's what in, uh, Inspiring Philosophy, Michael Jones, is trying to say. He's trying to say the God of the Bible would use evolution. I go, ooh, now we got a character of God problem, and we could talk about that. And then what about this whole evolution idea? What is evolution? Is it, is it just simply change over time? Because you actually discover there's several different types of evolution. Is it, uh, is it changing from one spe one kind of animal excuse me, into another kind of animal? Is it life coming from non-life? Uh, so where is it? And we've actually done, uh, my dad used to talk about this. And man, I think he does a great job of breaking this down into 
uh, the six different types of evolution. You got cosmic evolution, the origin of time, space, and matter. Chemical evolution, the 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 uh, the origin of all the different elements that we have today. Uh, cosmic chemical, you got uh, organic, the origin of life. Uh, stellar and planetary evolution, where did all the stars and the planets come from? Um, then you got, uh, let's see here, macro evolution would be changing from one kind of animal into a different kind of animal. You know, did we get the dog? You know, did it come from a banana and and that sort of thing? And then micro evolution, small variations within a kind. So it's not easy to just kind of throw it out there. Well, well, what about theistic evolution? It's like, well, what do you mean by theistic? Which God? And what do you mean by evolution? So you really end up having to unpackage a simple phrase like that to truly understand uh, what it's what it's talking about. And then, of course, you got to get into ev evidence against evolution, evidence for evolution, evidence against young earth and old earth, uh, for young earth, for old earth, uh, the history of evolutionary thought. Where did evolution even come from uh, as far as wh why do we believe it now? Uh, what does the Bible actually teach when you go back to the Hebrew? What does that say? Uh, and then what are the implications? Uh, well, and, and church history. And then what are the what are the implications of it? So there's a lot to unpack when it comes to what is theistic evolution. Sorry for that rabbit trail, but my mind has been thinking about this show I'm going to do. And I'm like, man, I, there's a lot to cover. I've got 450 slides right now for this one hour show that I'm going to do. So it's going to be tough. That's awesome. Well said. Yeah, it's important that we define our terms because what do we mean by evolution? If we mean change over time, sure, our phones change over time, our thinking processes change over time. T typically, the biological definition of evolution is changes in allele frequencies, gene right. variants, and populations over generations. So we don't have a problem with that. But if by evolution you mean banana plants and dogs are related through common ancestry, well, Eric, we're going to have an issue with that. And so <laughs> if, if we mean by evolution the theory of common descent, that all life is related, the secondary question is, is that compatible with God's word? No. Yeah. <laughs> and why? You want more than that? Oh. <laughs> I'm glad um, we agree. <laughs> uh, it's been a great show. Thanks for letting me hang out with you guys, man. Yeah. See you next time. <laughs> share this around, friends and family. Yeah, share that. The answer is no. Um, okay, so is theistic evolution compatible with the Bible specifically? That question, right? Right. Uh, right. It honestly, it's simply not. Number one, uh, and, and I just I, I could think of a whole bunch of reasons. It's not the historical position of the church. I mean, when did evolution come about? You know, they had ideas of evolution back with some Greeks and things like that, but not really formalized like we know it now as quote a scientific theory. So, is it compatible with the Bible? Not for a number of reasons. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible did it right the very first time, and he told us how he did it. If he had used evolution, matter of fact, I think I started writing. Oh, I did. I don't know if it's in this presentation, but I'll, I'll, I, I don't know where it's at. But I started writing a, if God used evolution, what would Genesis 1 sound like? Do I have right. that in here? Oh, it was so good. It was like, you know, it, it was just a totally different, you know, instead of God creating the heavens and the earth, and, and God said, let us make man on our image. All this stuff, it was it was all how let, let us evolve from the ape, you know, somebody that looks and re, like us. And it's not how he would write Genesis chapter one. The, the very scripture does not give us an idea of theistic evolution or of God using evolution. It's certainly not what Jesus taught. It's not what the apostles taught. I mean, some people say we shouldn't even be talking about this. We're wasting our time. Just focus on Genesis or just focus on what Jesus said. Forget about Genesis. I go, hold the phone here. If you, if you want to focus on Jesus, I think that's great because Jesus focused over and over and over on the book of Genesis. Jesus is the one who said Abel was there at the foundation of the world. So uh, Adam and Eve had, had two sons, Cain and Abel. You know, I mean, they had more, but the first two, Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. Jesus refers to Abel as the very first martyr that was killed at the foundation of the earth. And I, I put together a little a timeline. Uh, I'm not sure how much you want to just kind of go back through some of the material I covered in the debate, but I, I, I threw together an analogy of what when would Abel have existed compared to the foundation when, when right. the original creation of the heavens and the earth occurred according to the evolution worldview. And uh, should I should I pull those up real quick? Is that like yes? Uh, actually, I think because because I was going to point out, brother, that 
in your debate with with Michael Jones, which I watched a couple of times, I love that you kept bringing up that timeline, the evolutionary timeline versus the young earth creation timeline. Basically, it's just a, a little piece of hair <laughs> at the it, end. Yeah. Of, and you had very various illustrations. And so basically, what's the point of billions of years? And so if you wanted to touch on that or, or go through your slides on that, yeah, that'd be awesome. All right, let's do it. So this is uh, this is what is the point of the billions of years theistic evolution view? But by the way, this is this is the big issue. The biggest one is in a theistic evolution worldview. Sin comes into the world at the end, not at the beginning. I want to say that again for the guys because guys have to hear things twice. Okay, guys have to hear things twice. Okay, <laughs> in the theistic evolution worldview, sin comes at the end, not at the beginning. And that is a problem because the Bible says death came into the world by sin. So we got a big problem if sin doesn't come into the world until the very end now. All right. So that's the problem. So people wonder how long is 13.8 billion years? Because this is what the the theistic evolution worldview says. Hey, it's 13.8 billion years. Oh, by the way, they just this week announced they think there might have been two big bangs instead of one big bang. Now, the theory hasn't overtaken the scientific community, but. Yet again, it's changing, which I find interesting. Um, and I showed this chart that's a 23 foot long chart, uh, Adam's chart of history. And it goes through all the centuries from Adam until now. It's 23 feet long. And it's just fascinating to study this. It's a really cool chart uh, that you can get Adam's chart of history. I said, if we shrunk all 6,000 years of human history down to the width of a human hair, one one thousandth of an inch, if that was all of human history, what would... 13.8 billion years be represented by. I was like, oh, I, I, I was interesting when I it was interesting when I did the math on this. I'm like, am I doing this right? I called up Danny Faulkner and I'm like, I'm doing all these numbers, right? You know, cross multiply, divide. And he's like, yep, that's right. To get 13.8 billion years, your chart would be the size of a Boeing 777. And you get down to the end, the, the wing, the, the tip of the wing, and you find a human hair. And that is all of human history according to the evolution worldview. So theistic evolution puts billions of years of time and then man just now existing for the last, you know, 6,000 years. Now, some people say, well, I think man has been here for 70,000 years. Okay, that's fine. Now you got, you know, 16 feet of fence and you get down to the very end of your 16 feet of fence and you've got a human hair. And that is all of the time. And and then, of course, if, if you only believe that... Uh, Man has been around for 2 million years and kind of really fit the evolution worldview in there good. Well, we still have a human hair at the end of, what was it, nine? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine basketballs, nine uh, uh, NBA basketballs. So at the end of the last one, you got a human hair, and that's all of human history. So that puts sin coming in at the end of the world, not at the beginning. Danny Faulkner said adding billions of years to the biblical timeline, timeline is limiting God's power to create the world in six literal days. So this is to me the biggest issue. Did sin come into the world at the beginning or did it come into the world at the end? And that really is the big deal that we have to that we have to wrestle with. So theistic evolution is not compatible with scripture at all. And I, I really don't understand the point of billions of years in the first place. God doesn't need it. Uh, he doesn't need it at all. So I'll, I'll, I'll hold off right there and just... Uh, Say okay. Well, I don't want. I, I don't know if you. This is supposed to be a conversation because I can. I, I'll just keep going on this. I got. Like I said, Eric, we love the presentation, brother. You take your time, and like you an feel free to to go through any any slides that you feel important. I, I'll say this because I know Matt had a question he wanted to bounce off you based on what you just said. Okay. But what's the point of compromising a perfectly good book? God's word with a science that has been falsified. I mean, you've had Dr. John Sanford on your channel and it was an excellent interview. And he pointed out how in genetics, we've literally discovered Eve, the mother of all living. We've discovered Adam, the first man through Y chromosome DNA and mitochondrial DNA. And so we don't need to argue that, well, they weren't really the first people or they evolved from pre-human hominin ancestors. We don't need to because science has already uh, discovered our first parents. Eric? Yeah, I, I keep going. I, I just don't understand the billions of years. It doesn't fit with the Bible and it doesn't fit with science. So why are we trying to compromise God's word with a theory that's not true? Let alone 
the history of older thought. I don't, I don't, I discovered this about, I guess it's about two years ago. Uh, I'm speaking out in uh, Oregon, Portland, Oregon at the Design Science Association. A guy sitting right next to me, front row as I speak, is Milt Marcy. And Milt's like, hey, I sent my book to you. Did you read it? And I'm like, I'm sorry, I get sent a lot of stuff, didn't read it. And he starts telling me the history of older thought. And I'm like, this is fascinating. He's like, that's what's in my book. I'm like, okay, I'll read your book. <laughs> so I went and read his book and I'm going, no way. The modern idea of older thinking started with a guy named James Hutton. He wrote a book in 1795 called Theory of the Earth. When you research this, you discover James Hutton hated the Bible. He was trying to come up with a scientific way to discredit the Bible. And he knew, hey, if we go with Scripture, it's only a few thousand years old. It's not millions and billions of years old. That's clear from Scripture. So if we can say it's old, that discredits the Bible. And they literally invented older thinking to try to discredit the Bible. And today, we've got guys like Michael Jones and a whole bunch of other people going, oh, no, no, guys, 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 old earth, old earth, it's okay. It's okay. It fits with the Bible. And I'm like, what are you talking about? How can we be so duped? The very idea, I mean, isn't that pretty classic of Satan to get people to say, well, God exists and he used evolution or the earth is old. And it's like, do you have any idea how that idea even came about? James Hutton got a girl pregnant uh, out of wedlock. Of course, back then, that was a real no-no. You separated the man and the woman. She went to England. He went off to Paris. He studied, was it medicine or uh, lawyer? No, Lyle was the lawyer. So studied medicine. And uh, and anyway, it's it's he tried to destroy the Bible. This Charles Lyle is the next one that comes along and invents the geologic column and says, hey, instead of attributing the layers to the geologic column, instead of, uh, or to the earth, instead of attributing those layers to the flood, which is what they've always been attributed with, that was evidence of the global flood. That's exactly what the flood would give us. They're called sedimentary layers, which means laid down by water. So instead of those being attributed to the flood, let's attribute those layers to millions of years. Right. Maybe it was long periods of time that created all those layers, which even that doesn't make sense. Like, how do you get the extra layers? Where, where does that extra mass come from? So the earth has grown in mass. Who's creating the extra mass? Where is it coming from? Anyway, it, so uh, I'm getting off on a tangent, but it just, it does, older thinking was invented to destroy the Bible. Theistic evolution doesn't work. You got, you got death before sin. It's not the God of the Bible. You got millions of years. This is what I tried to point out to inspiring philosophy. You've got um, millions of years of death and disease, billions of years of death and disease and tried to show, look, if, if the theistic evolution worldview is true, if it's true, check this out. This, oh, I got to present again. This right here is, is what you would say how God created the heavens and the earth. This is, why, this, is, this is part of God's very good creation. God made it this way, and he's proud of it. This is what God wants. It's interesting because the atheist, atheistic writers write about this nature being tooth and claw and use it as evidence against the existence of God. This is not the way God originally created this world. God made it perfect. And then sin and death entered into God's perfect creation. So it's, it's, it's not correct to think that the theistic evolution God is the God of the Bible. This isn't the, the loving God that created everything perfect to begin with and then man wrecked it. And you also, with theistic evolution, you mess up the end. So, so not only do you mess up the beginning, you mess up the end because uh, the, the Bible makes it clear that one day the lion is going to dwell with the lamb. The leopard and the kid and the child and the fattling together and a, and a little child is going to lead them. It looks forward to a time when God's going to restore this world to paradise, what it used to be in the Garden of Eden. And with theistic evolution, you don't get paradise. You don't get this perfect place where the animals were vegetarian, uh, vegetarian according to Scripture. Everything uh, for meat was given to vegetables. And there's going to be a time when that happens again. So eat all the bacon while you can. Um, anyway. Uh, <laughs>
Uh, that would actually, that brings me to a verse then of that older creationist and theistic evolutionists bring up all the time is in Genesis, what, what about, what would you say to them who interpret that verse that death brought sin into the world, that the death being referred to is only to mankind and, and not anything to do with animals. So there could have been eons of times passing for animals dying and, but this doesn't refer to them. It's only talking about man. Yeah. If, if you're referring to Romans chapter five, that does talk about humans. But if you include the whole of Scripture, it is not just humans. Let me pull them up for us here uh, so that we can actually go through them. Because you go to Romans chapter 8, now you got another real problem. Um, you go to uh, 1 Corinthians, you got another real problem. The whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. Um, Which is a point Michael Jones, as you know, in, in your debate, focused on heavily. He kept bringing it back to this idea that animals did not or did experience death before the curse it only applies to humans although he'd say spiritually <clears throat> yeah okay so i guess let's make that a conversation so death did exist prior to adam and eve and it was animal death where does that idea come from what do you guys think evolution I mean, if you wanted to defend that with the Bible, how would you defend that with the Bible? Give, give me the scriptural, even anecdote, even story, even hypothesis. Where in scripture can we get animal death before sin? I know uh, Michael Jones would look to, and, and this was a question that I had on, on our uh, list here, was in Genesis where it talks about subduing and also having dominion. He would argue that this word subdue, kabosh, I think in, in the Hebrew, uh, has to do with harsh, harsh language, conquest. And so this would tell us that there was animal death before the fall. And I, and I would call that a huge stretch. I need to do a series of, uh, of slides on that to go through those verses. I don't have that going into the into the Hebrew of that because um, that that does need to be responded to, and I need to do that in a, in a good way. But the 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 terminology there, yes, is um, is is that what makes us think that it wasn't going to be toil to to subdue the earth. Mm -hmm. And and my point in the in the uh, in the debate. In the conversation was, well, hang on, hang on. Um, anybody who's grown a garden will tell you that it is toil, that it is like, okay, I'm 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 gonna go do this and I'm gonna work it and I'm gonna I'm gonna make this happen. So yeah, God gives God gives Adam the command to subdue the earth. I read a great article on that. I wish I need to put that together in a presentation specifically to go through that. But um but the, the phrase there is not, doesn't tell us that there was animal death happening. Right. It, it, it you can't, th there is nothing that tells us animal death was happening prior to the fall. So the, the scripture references Romans 6, uh, 23. We all know this one. For the wages <clears throat> of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Uh, go to uh, Romans 5, 12. Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and this is the verse they, they, they'll use just this one, so they can say it's only about man. So death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And they'll say, see, see, hey, look, it's only referring to human death. Right. That's all it's talking about here is human death. But this doesn't get the whole of Scripture. I mean, if we interpret Scripture with Scripture, it, it doesn't cover it. Romans 5, 14, death reigned from Adam to Moses. And he's like, oh, so was it supposed to stop with Moses? Well. No, but this is what it's, again, context is king, king, take all of this in context. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And this isn't just talking about human death. Romans chapter 8, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to utility. It wasn't always like that. It was subjected to that, not willingly, but because of him who, who subjected it. In hope, because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption 
into the glorious liberty of the children of God. This is, this is not the way God designed it. This is what we see today. And by the way, this is the biggest answer to the problem of evil. The problem of evil today, evil and suffering, which is the biggest objection to Christianity in the world. What about evil and suffering? See, God doesn't exist. It's only answered. The only way to answer evil and suffering is with a proper understanding of Genesis. God made it perfect. Man sinned and brought death into God's perfect creation. And through sin, through, through sin, death came in. And now we have lots of evil and suffering that's taking place in the world today. Romans 8, 22, we know that the whole creation groaneth and tra travaileth in pain together until now. It's not the way he used, it used to be. Until the times, the, re the restoration of all things. All things are going to be restored. Restored to what? Restored to what? I mean, we put the timeline up, or if we go before man and think of the, the billions of years, the eons of time of death and struggle and suffering, restored to that? Like, what are we going to be restored to? Death is going to be swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. Everything was created by him, and it was created for him. He is before all things, and, and in him all things consist. That all things may have the preeminence by him to reconcile all things to himself. All things, all things are going to be reconciled to God. Anyway, one day there's going to be no more tear, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more curses. Um, it's going to be good one day, and it's going to make it back to the way that it used to be. So when you take the whole of Scripture together, the leopard lying down with the lamb, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the leper shall lie down with the young goat, the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. Uh, it's, it's clear. Lion is going to eat straw like the ox. There's going to be a day when God makes very good creation again. So you can't look at very create, very good creation. Uh, and, and, or you cannot look at this world as though there never was a very good creation. Because now we have sin cursed into this world. It's a fallen and cursed world, but God's going to continue to redeem this world and make a new heaven and a new earth where and dwelleth righteousness. That's the way to look at it. So, um, it's anyway, we could keep going through verses, but that's the that's the idea there of of you can't you can't take just one verse, Romans chapter five, verse 12 and say, aha, it says man. Therefore, it's only talking about human death. You got to take all of creation together. Amen, brother. Well said. I really liked in the debate when you pointed out how in Genesis three, because of the curse, uh, God says, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, there's going to be pain in childbearing. So apparently before Adam and Eve, who were uh, elected in the garden, uh, Michael Jones would say as Adam being the high priest within a greater population of hominins, apparently those so-called pre-humans, they never experienced any pain in childbearing. That was pretty nice, man. I bet, I bet Adam and Eve were a little jealous of all the other people running around in the world. She's screaming, giving birth, and everybody's like, what is your problem? Shut up. Like, stop it. <laughs> right. It, it, it's a great, subtle point. And I'm curious as your thoughts, Eric, because in Genesis 3.14, uh, to the serpent, God says, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. And so doesn't that verse make it pretty clear that the entirety of the animal kingdom is cursed if the serpent would be cursed uh, above that. That would say that obviously all animals would also have to be affected by the curse too. I didn't even, I didn't even, uh, that one didn't dawn on me. I think that's great, man. Did you read that online somewhere? Did you come up with that yourself? That's really good. You know, Dr. Marcus Ross did an excellent job against Michael Jones and he pointed he that did. out. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well then I, I missed hearing that. I watched that debate <laughs> twice with, and by the way, I, I didn't want this to be a debate that mirrored or was just simply exactly what Dr. Marcus Ross did. That's why I tried mm -hmm. to couch this into, is it, because this debate was, is theistic evolution compatible with the Bible? Right. And so I pointed out very clearly, it's not compatible with the God of the Bible. We didn't even get into the science of evolution or the age of the earth issues, which would also come up. But um, uh, Marcus Ross did a great job of going, hold it, hold it. That's not what they were teaching. Uh, that's not, I mean, why isn't this historical? And I, I mean, man, I, I think of all the 
the different ways that this is not a historical uh, thing. This is not what the church fathers taught. How could, how could we have missed this for 1,800 years? <laughs> right. And all of a sudden, by the way, dink, it happened along with the, the rise of this thought of the earth is old, which was invented to discredit the Bible. Along with this rise of older thinking comes this idea that, oh, maybe the Bible is teaching old earth. And Michael Jones likes to, likes to try to say that, well, the church fathers believed this. No, they didn't. That is an absolute, it's either a lie or it's a very bad hermeneutic of history to study history and say that's what our church fathers taught. And I just, I spent this weekend going through, what did the church fathers believe about this? I got... Uh, I think those would be some good quotes to go through, uh, Eric, because it is a common assertion these days from theistic evolutionists that young earth creation is a modern invention. And so the question is, what did the majority of the church believe about this issue? Great question. Let me, uh, let's see here. Go back to, sorry, I'm having to go back between share screen and all this. <laughs> no worries at all. Um, the, uh, the, the, the church fathers, for the most part, did not believe in first of all this wasn't even an issue back then and that's the biggest thing you got to realize mm. this was not something that was even on their radar the idea of writing and defending against old earth ideas wasn't necessary there weren't old earth ideas i mean why would you write it against something that doesn't even exist yet it's like coming up with your defense of the faith against something that, that wasn't even an attack yet they didn't, they didn't need this kind of defense. But when you think about the history of biblical creation and you think about how people have thought about it through time, um, it, it, it just, the church fathers clearly didn't believe that. So I grabbed this. I think this is actually from a Catholic website. I found this timeline of, of church history. So when did the Crusades happen? When were the councils, you know, Council of Nicaea and stuff like that, New Testament era? era. And I tried to just go, okay, let's look at this and think, when did people start believing in old earth creation? When did we start actually teaching that? Um, here's just a, a, a chart showing the, the early church fathers. So, of course, you got Jesus, the, the head of the founder of the church. And then I think I made a, a, an easier to follow chart. Um, Jesus Christ, head of the church. He had disciples. Some of those were Paul, Peter, and John. Uh and then from there, we got kind of the next level, third tier from Jesus, or second tier from Jesus, Clement of Rome, uh, Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp. And so you can kind of see all the way down to Clement of Alexandria. And it's interesting, um, a lot of people use, um, well, let me just keep going through this. Uh, and let's see here. I don't have all these done yet. So, oh, by the way, um, Tim Chapey, my, my friend, Dr. Tim Chapey, did an incredible abstract in the Answers Research Journal, specifically going through Augustine. Did, uh, what did Augustine really think? Because, And he, he says in his abstract here, he goes, hey, listen, uh, everybody wants to claim Augustine is theirs, okay? Everybody thinks, no, he's on my side. The theistic evolutionist is like, he's with me. And the, the, the old earth creationists that say, I reject evolution, but I believe in old earth, go, oh, he's with me. And and then you got uh, young earth creation is saying, no, 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 he's with us. So he actually goes through and documents the, the true understanding of Augustine, who did change his mind throughout his thinking. So he did write differently about these things. Um, and he examines the commentaries on, uh, on Genesis by, by Augustine. St. Augustine, um, when he was writing to refute um, uh, a particular view that took everything is hyper literal. You know, if the trees clap their hands, well, then somehow those trees had hands. They, they took everything as hyper literal. Augustine offered two allegorical interpretations of the meaning of the six days. So he did allegorize them at one point. First, he sees the creation of days representing the six ages of the world. He also gave a more personal allegorical interpretation, in which each day of creation corresponds to a specific development period in a person's life. So he said, maybe that's what you go through from, from sinner to saint, and maybe these are different stages that the individual goes through. Later on, here we are in circa 393. Um, so then, he says, although it is without any stretch of time being involved that God makes things, having the power to act available to him whenever he will, um, all the same, the time-bound nature is 
made by him go through their temporal movements in time. And we see him changing to more of a, oh, maybe it is actually six literal days. Uh, so we see Augustine actually go through this. Augustine firmly believed that the true science and the true interpretation of Scripture would agree in detail. However, rather than following his own advice, he frequently rejects the plain interpretation of Scripture because he was committed to a particular philosophical and scientific belief. And he was committed to these things, and some of those have now been debunked. He actually committed the same fallacy that Hugh Ross is committing and that Michael Jones with Inspiring Philosophy and so many other Christians are committing. He's taking modern scientific ideas and holding them over the truths of Scripture. Rather than saying, no, Scripture is the authority, and that's going to interpret our science, he's saying, well, let's let science be the authority and interpret Scripture. I... Uh, I have this clip that I, I play. It's in here, but uh, it's it's in the conversation I got to have with Dr. Hugh Ross, and I asked Dr. Hugh Ross, and I was real curious about this. And this, I mean, in this conversation, you got to understand, I'm praying, God, how do we show? How, how does Dr. Ross himself admit that science is above Scripture? Because he says they're equal in his eyes. You got the book of Scripture and the book of nature, and they're equal. And I go, first of all, they're not. The book of nature is cursed. It's corrupt. This is the one that's not. We got to we, we got to be careful when we interpret this, the book of nature, because it's been corrupted. So we're dealing with a fallen world, and uh, and in this clip, I said, and I, I honestly, I feel like it was just God giving me this question. I'm like, okay, I think this is a good one. Let's see how this goes. I don't know where it's going to go. I said, Doctor Ross, would uh, let me? I should show it to you guys. Will my sound play? Is it going to work if I play a video on here? As long as, firstly, I remember that uh, clip and section from the debate. That was great, Eric. Um, as long as when you share screen, it'll give you an option <clears throat> to share okay. audio. So as long okay. as that's checked on, then you should be able to play the clip. Love your slides, by the way, Eric. Excellent work exactly. you, you've put into those. To me, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I, I have yeah. fallen asleep during more sermons than you can imagine. So uh, <laughs> I... Just like I'm okay, a visual just, learner, I appreciate it. Yes, just keep the visuals coming, baby. Keep the yes. visuals coming. The more, the better. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, how about this? Okay. So here's the conversation. Oh, you know what? Okay. So is it going to play? Can you guys hear that? Um, only very faintly. But if you were to stop the screen yeah, share and then re share, sure yeah. and just make sure to click share audio, you should be good. All right. So let me try that one more time. Sorry about that. This is a great clip to show, Eric. And I've, I've seen this clip being shared around a lot on YouTube, too. So, uh, Oh, uh, have you? Of, okay. Oh, yeah. To share audio, audio, share a tab. Oh, share a tab instead, you mm. losers. Uh, StreamYard <laughs> won't let me do it. Oh, that was the oh, problem no. I had in that debate. They were using StreamYard as well. And so you can't... Uh, you can't actually do it. And how high is my volume? My volume's all the way up here. I don't think. You could hear it faintly, though. So it. Okay, let me let me turn this volume up. Okay. Turn this volume way up. Can you get? Are you guys going to be really loud? Say something. Hello. Okay. <laughs> That's loud. Evolution's false. <laughs> All right, let's try this. Let's see if this works. Let's give it a shot. There we go. All right, let's see if this comes through. And this is this is my deal. You know, the credibility of Christ is at stake here. Okay, this is my big deal. So, conversation with you, Ross. If science tomorrow comes out, all the scientists. Oh, I gotta it's, stay on it. Sorry. It, it's coming through good, Eric. They go. Guess what, guys? We were wrong. It's a young earth. And all the scientists agree with that. Would that change your interpretation of scripture? It definitely would. It definitely would. 100%. That's the problem. That's exactly that. And that's what we were saying at the beginning. Because you are saying if the scientists say this, I'm, I'm, here's about the book of nature. It's Billy 14 points. Uh, 13.79 billion years old plus or minus 0.04 for the universe and 4.5662 billion years old for the age of the earth plus or minus 0 0.001 and if they change that will change your interpretation of scripture that 
is my point. That's the problem. So I really do see that as the issue. And it made me wonder, like, what does, like, the Hugh Ross of 1980, when we were saying it's 18 billion years old. Right. Would he have said, nope, Scripture teaches it's 18 billion. I mean, he's at 13.79. He's trying to be that exact, plus or minus 0.04. <laughs> I'm like, well, as that continues to change, what do we do here? Like, how do we handle this, you know? Right. Um, well, let's see. Here. So, church fathers, sorry for the distraction there. No, that's not a distraction at all. That's very telling. It, it shows who their final authority is. And, wow. Yeah, yeah, I love those two debates you did, Eric, with Hugh Ross and with Michael Jones. Seriously, you did a fantastic job, and that's that, that's a great clip. I'm glad you show, you showed it. So Bishop uh, uh, Iranius, uh, he very clearly, uh, who he was a celebrated for a scholarship, uh, one of our church fathers, very clearly believed in young earth, and this is you know this is he lived from 130 to 202, uh, mm. so this is right after the time of Christ, you know. Um, Still, still right there, clearly taught that it was that it was a normal creation. For as in many days as this world was made, in so many thousand years it shall be concluded. And for this reason, the scripture says, and by the way, I don't know that, that he was correct on this, that, hey, God made it in six days, rest of the seventh. Therefore, we're going to have a 7,000 year period of earth history. I don't, I get that. I don't know that we can really follow that. But anyway, that's what he believed. Um, for this reason, the, the scripture says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. And all their adornment, and God brought to a conclusion upon the sixth day the works that he had made, and God rested upon the seventh day from all his works. So he clearly did not hold to a, an old earth idea or uh, anything like that. Um, how do you say this guy's, uh, this church father's name? Any idea? Hippo, Hippolytus? I, I think so. Hippo, Hippolyte, Hippolytus okay. is how, how I'd say it. Matt, you too? Uh, it's Greek. Yeah, oh, yeah I was to say. <laughs> It had to sound way different than that, but uh, good old Mr. Hippo, uh, he was one of the one of the most important uh, second and third century Christian theologians. He was a disciple of Irenaeus, and he was said to be a disciple of Polycarp. He said, "And as God labored during those six days in creation, such great works, so His religion and truth must labor during these six thousand years." So this was a popular popular idea back then. While wickedness prevails and and bears rule, and again, since God having finished His works rested the seventh day and blessed it. At the end of the 6,000 years, all wickedness must be abolished from the earth and righteousness reign for a thousand years. So believed a similar view and again, believed in a literal six-day creation. Um, Lucius, uh, another early Christian, this is 250 to uh, 325. Therefore, since all the works of God were completed in six days, all works of God, so all the creation, the world must continue to its present state through six ages. So similar thing, 6,000 years. That's what he believed. Uh, uh, Basil uh, believed this. Uh, another influential church father said, uh, it is therefore says one day it is from a wish to determine the measure of a day and night and to combine the time that they contain. Now 24 hours fill up the space of one day. We mean of a day and of a night. And if at the, <laughs> at the time of the solstices they have not both an equal length, the time marked by scripture does not the less circumscribe their their duration again he believed in the basic six days so all of these i don't want to bore you guys because i i literally just did a ton of these thomas aquinas and all, all, as you go through history they believed in a literal six days it's not until recently uh even martin luther believed in the six days uh calvin believed in the six days hugh latmer i mean we're up into 1500s now uh believed in six days westminster confession Clearly believed, you know, it pleased God the Father, the Son, in the space of six days. That's the Westminster Confession of Faith, 1646. Believed in six days. John Calvin uh, believed in six days. Uh, very clearly, God perfected it uh, at once in, the, in six days, took place in the space of six days. Uh, so the only one we really question about it is, is Augustine, and, and we see that he was conflicted about it. And I recommend you read Tim Chafee's article on that. John Wesley believed in the six days. Uh, he wrote about the six days. Uh, let's see here. Then we get to today. Mark Knoll. He is a historian at the University of Notre Dame, and he makes the claim the church fathers never taught six-day <laughs> creation. I'm like, Mark, what are, what are you talking about? He goes, oh, no, 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 creation. This is from Mark Knoll. Creation spread like wildfire in our century from its humble beginnings in the writings of Ellen White, the Seventh-day Adventist. 
the one who began Seventh-day Adventist, the, oh, it says right there, the, the founder of Seventh-day Adventism, to its current status as a gospel truth embraced by tens of millions of Bible-believing evangelicals and fundamentalists around the world. What? This view did not start with Ellen White. She's not the one who started this idea. Anyway, so Mark Knoll, uh, Michael Jones, same thing, makes videos uh, on YouTube and, and is saying that, no, they, they really didn't believe that. That's not what uh, the early church fathers believed. Look, at these are some commentaries. You can see the years here, 1639, 1655, 1817, uh, 1809, 1809, 1764. You can see all these. What did they believe? Data creation. Boom, 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 boom. Here's what they thought. Few of them thought it was ages ago, 1792 and 1803. What did they think about Genesis 1-1? It was a day. It was a summary. No comment, no comment. One day, summary. One day, one day, one day, summary. No comment, no comment. How long is a day? 24 hours, 24 hours, 24 Okay, you got two here that are ages ago. Two of them. And again, that's influenced by the older thinking that had just come about. Uh, so yeah, we could even go to uh, the Eastern Greek, uh, or, uh, Eastern Orthodox view on Genesis 11. They clearly teach from 300 up to 1800. It's a literal set, uh, days of creation. So they give it up to 7,500 years. There's a curse on the whole creation. There was a global flood. And all the people in the world today came from Adam via Noah's family because they're the ones who survived on the ark. Ah. Uh, I put these questions for evol theistic evolutionists in here, but I get it. let me show you. I think I inserted. Oh, uh, I wanted to go to that that incredible, incredible source, Wikipedia. Um, so I, obviously, I don't agree with everything on Wikipedia, but when you look up, you know, date of creation on Wikipedia, it'll tell you what do the Chinese believe, what do these mean. And it's like, okay, what about what? What did the early Jewish estimations? What did the Jews believe? They clearly believed the, the Bible was, was correct and that we had a date of creation. There was somewhere, of course, now this is 2,000 years ago that they're writing this or even before that. There was somewhere around 4,300 B.C., 3,700 B.C., 3,700 B.C. So the Jewish estimations believe that. The Greek Septuagint, if we take it, all the writers that wrote that had that as their commentary, they're like, okay, 5,000, 5,500, somewhere around 5,500, 5,400, 5,200. BC is when the creation took place. So you get that over and over and over from the people that had the Greek uh, Septuagint. Um, let's see here. The, the, the people that went with the Masoretic text, these are all commentaries from the Masoretic text, people that wrote, when was the creation? And I just did a show on that, by the way, with, um, you know, why, why is there a difference between the Hebrew and the, the, the um, Hebrew Masoretic and the um, Greek Septuagint? And it's very, very interesting to go into these numbers. But again, clearly, look at these numbers, 4,100 B.C., 4,100 B.C., 4,000 B.C., 4,000 B.C., 4,004, 4,005, 4,002. Nobody's coming up with the millions of years. So for all of church history, we have them believing that it's basically somewhere around 4,000, 5,000 B.C. is the date of creation. And now we're going to act like nobody believed that? Again, are you lying or are you ignorant? It's got to be one or the other. There's not a lot of other choices out there. It's funny, isn't it, that they built their calendars based off that. The Hebrew Jewish calendars are all young earth creation. They're not old earth. So exactly. if they believed it. <laughs> so where, where would their calendar have started then? I mean, why, why, like, what was the starting point of the Jewish calendar to start? I mean, what are we in like 50, 900, something like that on the Jewish calendar? 59 something on the right. Jewish calendar. I don't remember exactly, but yeah. So, so where did that get started? I mean, do you have another, do you, can you even postulate an idea of what they started with? Right. What, why was their mindset uh, old earth creation? If they're creating a young earth creation calendar, <laughs> it's, it's so logical. Yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Yeah. Well, you guys have researched this too. What do you guys think about it? Like how in the world, I, it just, well, it doesn't make sense to me. Firstly, love the slides, very comprehensive. The exception wouldn't overturn the rule anyways, if there are a couple cases where, you know, we, we could debate. And it's concerning. I'm going to put up this image, Eric. This is from your debate with Michael Jones. And it's related to your, your presentation here on the Church Fathers because it concerns me. And context-wise, what I mean by that is inspiring philosophy he claims Genesis 1-1 is interpreted or translated incorrectly. He thinks it should be translated when God began to create the heavens and the earth because rather than an absolute beginning here, 
creation, ex nihilo. He wants to argue that this was when God put order to a chaotic universe. So rather than material creation, he looks to functional creation. But nobody in church history interpreted it this way. And as far as I know, I looked at a lot of Bible translations and basically every single Bible translation agrees with, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But here, Michael Jones wants to say everybody else has been wrong. Everybody today is wrong. And it's it's mistranslated. Eric, could you speak to that a little bit? I got a slide about that. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. If I can do this again, sorry. Yeah. Oh man, I got so much. All right, let's. No see. worries. This is great. Because, uh, because yeah, that is. It. And the big question comes down to what they're trying to say, and they've only been doing this for the last two hundred years, saying that in the beginning is a de dependent clause, right. meaning it depends on something else rather than an independent clause. So right. that's that's kind of their big deal. Okay. So is is Genesis one verse number one in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Is that an independent clause or is that a de dependent clause? And uh, Michael Jones says, listen, we've gone through the Hebrew. Actually, it's not in the beginning. It's when God began to create, when God did that. Now, again, lots of other problems with that, but is it independent or is it dependent? Uh, let's see here. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Is it independent or is it dependent? And Michael actually refers to uh, the scholar, Dr. Joshua Wilson. I got to have him on one of my shows. I, I didn't know about him before uh, that debate and before this research. And, and Michael's like, listen, Dr. Wilson tries to claim that it would make the next verse, that next part, it would make it a really long sentence. And if it's long, that makes it awkward. That is not Dr. Joshua Wilson's like sole argument. It does make for a very messy reading of the original text messes it up. But that's not Dr. Wilson's argument. Instead, let's let Dr. Wilson present his argument, okay? He says, not surprisingly, the ancient translators of the Septuagint, the Greek, the Vulgate, the Latin, and the <clears throat> Aramaic, how do you say that, tar Targums? Targums, yeah. Okay, and the Aramaic, the Targums, amongst others, recognized the types of grammatical constructions. They knew grammar. They had the language figured out. They frequently translated them as relative clauses. So he's pointing out that are there other passages of the Bible that treat this, a similar wording as a relevant, a dependent clause rather than an independent clause? He's like, yes. And the writers of these, these and the translators, they knew that in other places they did that correctly. They did it right. Yet, none of these translations, not one, recognizes Genesis 1.1 as one of these constructs. They don't recognize it as a relative clause, as a dependent clause. They were all wrote about it and they all translated as an independent clause. That's all you need. Um, so they all rendered it in the verses in the traditional manner as the independent clause. He says in both English and Hebrew, the word beginning is not a typical noun. It is a relator noun, which means it needs extra information to complete its meaning. To think about it another way, English relator nouns like front, back, middle, left, and end, by themselves, these words don't communicate much. In front of what? The middle of what? The beginning of what? Usually these relator nouns are joined to other nouns to give them that needed extra information. The end of the couch, the left side of the couch, the back of the couch. And he goes on, and I, I, man, the the notes, the the, the link, you can find this. This was at uh, on, um, this was written for a. Oh, I had it up here. Um, and after, this is in answers in depth. If you do a search for this, Dr. Joshua Wilson answers in depth. Have we misunderstood Genesis one one? It's the only one that'll come up. Okay, that's this is where he wrote it. Um, he concludes, and and he says, however, there are. Oh, I, I hit that, didn't I? Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah, okay, this is where he continues. There are instances in both English and Hebrew where relator nouns can stand alone with clear meaning. That is, without another noun like couch, connecting it grammatically. In such cases, the relator noun get their extra information from the context. For instance, at the conclusion of a movie, the phrase, the end, stands alone, and it's contextually related to the events of watching the movie. 
We don't need the words of the movie to be added to the words the in to know what is being communicated on the screen. The Hebrew word resha, beginning, uh, stands alone in Genesis 1.1 and Isaiah 46.10, as does the similar word ros. As I, I don't know if I'm saying that right. I, I got the Hebrew alphabet down and then I kind of, Olivet, Gimel, Dalet, hey, and I did a little bit, but uh, I didn't keep on going. I should have kept on going. Uh, in, in Proverbs 8.23 and Isaiah 40.21, where it refers to the beginning of the creation, the context of the passage gives us the information that is needed. So he is wrong that people are doing this, uh, or that, that the, the, the writers intended to mean when God started to create the heavens and the earth. He's wrong about that. That's not what it is. And, and I do think it's interesting that the writers chose this form to write because he compares it to the Enuma Elish and things like that. Um, Dr. Louis Marcos, by the way, um, I, I have on Audible uh, his book, and you guys should get it, uh, The Myth the myth Made Fact, okay? And Dr. Louis uh, uh, reads this himself. You guys need to have him on. I mean, what a, what a genius guy that understands literature and history. I mean, I was the D student in English class, okay? I, the, the, the reels that show how stupid the English language is, I get those because I'm like, yeah, why would you spell it that way and that way and do this? And here's the rule and here's the 20 exceptions. So anyway, Dr. Louis Marcos, dude, his brain gets all that, okay? He loves it. He loves the, the, the Greek mythology and he shows how the Bible was written to, uh, Genesis was written to people coming out of Egypt no doubt they would have heard about the Egyptians' gods. No doubt they knew about this. No doubt some of them were, were understanding this. And Moses certainly knew about it. Man, he was raised with it. He understood it. He was an incredibly smart man. He was incredibly learned. I've even heard people like Andy Stanley, like to these, you know, people, you know, in the Middle East that, that didn't know anything. And I'm like, didn't know anything? I think they were really smart. They had 40 years with Moses as well, who was probably one of the highest trained guys around. I mean, he was raised as Pharaoh's son. Anyway, Louis, Dr. Louis Marcos does a great job of going through, and he talks about John Walton trying to relate Genesis, Genesis to the Enuma Elish, an Egyptian you know, idea of the beginning of the world. And he's like, isn't it interesting? What really is happening here is Genesis is giving us the true account of history. And yes, it can compare in style, but it's giving us the truth rather than a myth. God didn't replace the Enuma Elish myth with another myth. He replaced it with the truth. Anyway, I, um, he's, he's, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to read all this. We'd be here. I don't know how long you guys want to go, but uh, all of these. Here, I'll throw them on the screen so you guys can pause them. I'll do that. That way you guys can. If you want to read it, this whole part on this, just pause one at a time here on Dr. Louis Marcos. But anyway, he says, The Enlightenment drove a wedge between reason and imagination, logic and institution, science and religion the rational, the emotional, history and myth, uh, and facts and values. And he's like, we got to bring these things back together. This, our modern day thinking is the problem that won't allow these things to, uh, to, to come together the way they used to. So I'll let you read all this quote if you want. Uh, C.S. Lewis, about the myth made fact is how C.S. Lewis came up with the reality that, wow, maybe this is the, the myth uh, made fact. Um, let's see here. The Enuma Elish is treated as the Rosetta Stone and then uh, is it Gordon Johnson? Is this the guy? Let's see here. There's a guy who wrote a lot about, oh, here it is, here it is, here it is. Did Genesis, you guys got to look this up. If, for those of you that have heard the, uh, the Genesis is just borrowing from other creation accounts, uh, James Rochford did a great job uh, on his article. That's the link to the article right there on the screen. It does a great job of explaining this. He goes, yes, there are, there are similarities between Genesis and the Enuma Elish. Unfortunately, critics have exaggerated the superficial similarities and downplayed the major, major, major differences. A cursory reading of both texts reveals the stark dissimilarities between the two accounts. First, Genesis teaches monotheism. The Enuma Elish teaches polytheism. Genesis depicts God as self-existent. The Enuma Elish uh, states that the gods themselves were uh, contingent. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, contingent. Okay. I'm reading too fast here. Third, Genesis pictures humans as the crown of creation. The Enuma Elish considers humans as slave labor to the gods. Genesis describes creation from nothing. 
the Enumina at least considers matter as eternal. And that's one of the ideas that's adopted into theistic evolution uh, or a form of that. Genesis describes the sun, moon, and stars as mere creations, whereas the Enuma Elish considers these to be gods. Genesis gives no description of a cosmic conflict where the Enuma Elish begins with the gruesome conflict of the gods. Genesis describes the fall of humans, not the gods. Genesis offers an elegant simplicity to the creation account. Enuma Elish is far more complex, cruel, and convoluted. So you got lots and lots of problems with the Enuma Elish, trying to compare that to the Genesis account. Yet that's what Michael Jones, and that's what, um, uh, who's the other guy that he's getting it from? Uh, Walton? Yeah, John Walton. That's what that's what they're trying to do, is, is to say that there's a lot of similarities, similarities there, and that's where they're getting it. So anyway, I uh, recommend you you check out uh, what, uh, what James said about that, because he did a great job. Is the universe a cosmic temple? No, it is not a cosmic temple. That's another thing that's stated. Modern readers are too biased to interpret Genesis 1. Nope, this is not a cosmic temple. That view that John Walton pro uh, projects is simply not the case. Anyway, you can, uh, another article he wrote totally debunks Walton's view. It's not the majority view. Um, it's, it's, it's sad. So anyway, there's, like I said, I don't know how long you wanted me to go on this, but. That's great. I mean, I, I was going to say right there is a, is a clip worthy presentation answering that argument thoroughly because it's an argument that's often repeated. I'm, I'm curious, Eric, we had uh, doctors, Jason Lyle and also oh, wow. Jonathan Sarfati on, and <clears throat> they described how Genesis, the way that the Hebrew verb form is used in Genesis, the Vav consecutive, it indicates that it is most certainly literal history and not mytho history as a lot of these theistic evolutionists assert, including William Lane Craig. He's on record saying it's literal history. So the, the Vav consecutive as in it's written, you know, and this happened and then that happened. And right. so in your opinion, is, is that a solid refutation of these guys that just continue asserting that this is, this is all mytho history rather than literal history? Absolutely. Cause you can't read, I was trying to find it. John, Dr. Jonathan Gibson, <laughs> Got a slide for that. Wouldn't you be surprised? Okay. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Dick Gibson does a great job. He's a Hebrew scholar. So this is his field. He's been studying Hebrew for years. This is exactly what he talks about all the time. Okay. So this is what he teaches. This like, this literally is what he does. And as I, as I went through on a show with him, does the Hebrew Bible teach six day creation? I was like, I just want to get this settled. Does it teach six day creation? He's like, absolutely. Here's what he said. I sort of found the day age view enticing, the analogical view. Uh, I liked some of the literary frameworks. This is as he's trying to figure this out for himself. So I arrived at my college as a sort of open to all perspectives on it, not wanting to be too hardcore. Then uh, we then, then we then, okay, I got a typo there. Uh, we then studied, uh, then I studied, I guess is what it's supposed to be. Then I studied the Hebrew and since then have studied the text of Genesis 1. I've come back to my original conviction the literal interpretation of the days of creation is the most sensible and the most reasonable. And it is the interpretation that's been held as the dominant view throughout the history of the church. So that's how I arrived at it, going back to the Hebrew and studying it more carefully. I think we have everything we need in the biblical record to affirm a literal six-day creation week, plus a young earth. My position on the young earth view is taken from the biblical text. This is what the Hebrew scholars are saying. This is where it comes from. If mankind has only been on the earth for 10,000 or less years, and this is the whole point of creation, but God created the world billions of years ago. What? Here's another guy, just like Danny Faulkner. What's the point of the billions of years where mankind would come on the earth and Christ would come to save us? Why do you need it? I mean, just think overall biblical worldview picture. Terry Mortensen, by the way. Oh, you got to get his uh, Coming to Grips with Genesis, another great book. Terry Mortensen, I mean, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say, but let me just say he was a very good friend, a very good friend of somebody that you just mentioned. Um, okay, I think I can say that. He was a very close friend of William Lane Craig. And I can't go into detail just because he was, it was told to me in privacy, but it's like, it's sad where William Lane Craig is now. It's very, very, very sad. Anyway, 
And uh, Terry Mortensen, uh, incredible writer, researches stuff on answers in Genesis. Stephen Boyd asserts in the biblical Hebrew verb, create always has God for its subject and never mentions the material from which he created. Its presence in a verse, therefore, underscores that God is the creator. Uh, in reading Genesis 1-2, both John Collins and Richard Averbeck point out that the A&E writings, ancient Near East is what that is, did think in terms of material creation. Because they like to say, oh, they weren't even thinking material creation. Yes, they arranged things, but they also made stuff. Okay, so uh, anyway, then we get into John Day and what he believed about that. So uh, it's, it's important to understand uh, that these Hebrew scholars, they, they, the, the, what you were talking about, the uh, Toledo, because Dr. Jonathan Gibson goes through that and he's like, Look, these, these and then, and this, and then this happened, show this is, this is not a, a story of, of exaggerate. This is not poetic. This is not allegorical. Oh, uh, Exodus 14 and Exodus 15. I don't know if you guys have ever read those. You read Exodus 14 and Exodus 15. Do I have those in here? That, that's going back and forth showing the, the poem that was written about the account and then the actual account, one chapter apart from each other. You can actually see what it looks like when God does, uh, or when they do, um, is that it? No, Exodus 11. Oh, here it is, here it is, look at this. Yeah, let alone, okay, ah, so many verses. You just let the Bible speak, speak man. You're never going to come up with the millions and billions of years, okay? Exodus 14, verse 21 to 23. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them, unto their right hand and unto their left hand. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, even all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Okay, now, let's go to chapter 15. Now they're recounting this, and they've written a song about it. If creation was a song, creation would look a lot more like this. Here you heard the real story. Here's the song. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains are also drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, is becoming glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Exodus 15, if we were to take that literal, if we were to take that literal, what would we have to conclude from uh, Exodus 15? That the Lord is a man with nostrils, that Pharaoh's army was cast into the sea and drowned, dashed into pieces, consumed, consumed like stubble, and swallowed by the earth. You don't take Exodus 15 as literal. You take it as a poetic telling of what happened. 14 is literal. This is what happened. Moses stretched out his hand. They went across on dry land. Pharaoh chased him. The water came down and crushed him. And now we have the poem, the song that's written about this event. So anyway, Tim Chafee has a great book, Old Earth Creation on Trial, uh, that I highly recommend because it goes through all of this. So <sighs> uh, <laughs> am I supposed to be talking about all this? I don't know. Yes, absolutely. We like to be comprehensive. The audience is loving it. I'm loving it. This is great. And th this is what Matt and I seek for is thorough rebuttals to these commonly asserted uh, points and arguments. Do you find there's a bit of a straw man, Eric, from the theistic evolutionists? When we say we interpret the Bible literally, they assume that we mean some kind of wooden literalism. But what we really right. mean is we're interpreting it literarily, as in we read it according to its context. And we use the context to determine its meaning. And so like you pointed out there, we recognize poetry, we recognize literal history, we recognize metaphors. And in your debate, you, you made a lot of great points, but one specifically, I think it was Jeremiah 4, that is Jeremiah is basically prophesying about the future destruction of Judah if the Israelites don't repent. And he takes that poetry or metaphor and then goes backwards, interprets Genesis 1 in light of that. But I like to point out that with any good metaphor, Eric, you need an anchor point. And so that anchor point is a real event in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And Jeremiah is using that real event 
to describe something in, in Jeremiah 4. If you could speak to that, Eric. I've got those as a slide, if that's okay. Of course, yes. <laughs> That's what we like. <laughs> so yes, you hear this argument presented. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And that phrase, without form and void, that phrase right there in the Hebrew, uh, this one right here, the earth was without form and void. In Hebrew, that's the phrase tohu wabohu. And it literally, if you translate it, it means unformed and unfilled. The earth was unformed and unfilled. It was formless and it was void. That's literally what that means. So People will say, well, that is only used one other place in the Bible. And they're right. If that exact phrase is only used one other place in the Bible. The only other place in the Bible they find that phrase used is in Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, I beheld the earth and lo, it was without form and void. Ah, and they say, well, here's the same phrase. It's obviously borrowing from Genesis. So what's going on here in Jeremiah? The heavens and they had no light. And as you read the context of Jeremiah 4, this is talking about a destroyed, a ruined world. It was a messed up place by the time you get to Jeremiah chapter 4. Uh, so Jeremiah is lamenting, oh my goodness, it's bad. It's really bad. I beheld the earth low is without form and void. And so what people try to do is they say, well, see, that's the same phrase. That's referring back to Genesis. Here it's referring to a destroyed world. There it's, it's, it's uh, referring to a destroyed world. And we point out, no, 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 no. It's telling us that the earth now is unformed and unfor uh, uh, unfilled. It's a bad, terrible place now. But it's referencing Genesis because in Genesis, it was good. That's why God said it was very good. At the end of Jeremiah, Jeremiah doesn't say, and it was very good. Uh-uh. You don't find that phrase mentioned along with un uh uh, tohu wabohu in Jeremiah. So it's referencing it, but that's giving us this idea that, man, it's, 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 it's uninhabited now. It's a bad place. And we know it's not specifically mirroring Genesis because it says right there, all the birds of heaven were fled. Well, in Genesis, the birds, quote, hadn't even been made yet. Those don't come along until day number five of creation. So we got a real problem here. If those aren't till day five, and this is, you know, Genesis chapter one, verse number two. So it doesn't fit. And you got another problem here trying to relate that. And that's over and over and over. God says he rested on the seventh day. Even outside of Genesis, it refers to the emphatic seventh day, not a seventh day, but the seventh day. Many, many times, the seventh day, Exodus 31, the seventh day he rested from his work, Genesis 2, 2, the seventh day got into his work, Genesis 2, 3, 3, God blessed the seventh day. Hebrews 4, 4, he spoke in a certain place of the seventh day. So it, it doesn't work. People before this had uh, used this to try to help out the gap theory idea. And some of the gap theory concepts fit into theistic evolution, I guess. But um, especially when it comes to Michael Jones, he's kind of got his, his, he's trying to pick and pull. Even though this guy disagrees with this guy, he pulls a little bit from this guy and a little bit from this guy and tries to bring them together even though these guys would be like, you can't do that. No, that doesn't work. You can't pull those together. So he's trying to pull a couple of different ideas to kind of create a synthesis that, that he can accept or that he's okay with. But his whole problem is he's still got death before sin. He's still got an old earth worldview, which was invented to destroy the Bible. Uh, he's still accepting uh, a God that used millions of years of death and suffering and struggle. So you still got a lot of problems uh, when you start trying to bring in the evolution worldview into the Bible. Excellent point. So, uh, Matt, it looked like you were going to say something, actually. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, I find it peculiar that in the Bible it says that God created the earth to be inhabited, but he would have waited billions of years to not let it be inhabited. It just <laughs> doesn't make good sense. That is a very, very valid point. We should list all these points out and just come up with a list uh, of, <laughs> of points. I did have a list of questions, but I'm like, you know what? Next time I do something with a theistic evolutionist, I do want to have a list of questions prepared. So I started a list of questions, and I, I don't know, I thought they were kind of good. Uh, here's some, you guys can freeze frame these. Here's sure. a list of, uh, of, of questions for a theistic evolutionist. As I, this is just me thinking through the process here. Of uh, Actually, this, this list, uh, let me see here. I found some of these on different places online, too, with different people asking, uh, asking about this. 
what are the uh, what are the possible purposes for God creating humans through millions of years of evolution and then masquerading the truth behind a seemingly contradictory contradictory narrative? So to the theistic evolutionists, we have to, a- have to ask the question, why is God lying? Uh, how do you know what parts of the Bible to take literally? Who determines who determines the meaning of Scripture? You know, who gets to decide? Are you allowed uh, scientists allowing scientists to deter- to determine the interpretation of Genesis one uh, and two for you? Um, which biblical characters knew about the true origins uh, of mankind? If the answer is none, does that concern you? What's the allegorical interpretations of living beings created according to their kinds? Uh, even though Scripture deals with complex scientific issues, being in the blood. Uh, Leviticus, shape of the earth, Isaiah, it never hints at humans being evolved from animals. You know, we've discovered all kinds of things in the Bible that we didn't discover for thousands of years, and now they're revealed. It's like, oh, the Bible got it right, and science finally has discovered this. Well, here it's like, it seems like the Bible got it wrong, and science discovered it is what the theistic evolution is saying. Anyway, so lots of great questions when it comes to theistic evolution. I had one that I was, I got to add to this list. Uh, Okay, there you go. I got to add to this list because I was actually thinking... Um, get back to. I like that one. Well, I like them all. I like that one at the top. Did Jesus die for beings other than Homo sapiens? So, what would these theistic evolutionists? Because a lot of them argue that Neanderthals, which were a sophisticated people group, were not human. Old, old Earth Cretaceous would argue that, and a lot of your other hominins like Homo erectus, Homo floresiensis, which had evidence for again being a sophisticated people. So, did Jesus die for them? Because they don't necessarily descend right from Adam and Eve. And are there still descendants today of people that were not from Adam and Eve? That goes against genetics. That goes against scripture. You know, Eve is the mother of all living. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, if he's the mother of all living, I mean, that's what scripture says. Well, how do we interpret that now? So, yeah, some of them, we're, we're, some of them think they're uh, Nephilim. Uh, there you go. <laughs> well, I'd be curious what your thoughts are. So I want to represent Michael Jones' argument here so uh, accurately. So in his debate with you, he argued that, well, you've got the uh, six days of creation, God rests on the seventh. Genesis 2 is furthering that story. It's a sequel, I believe he called it. So basically, we're looking at day eight, and the creation of man there is not the same creation of man on day six. Man on day six was basically humanity in general. Day eight, which he says is a sequel to Genesis one. This is when God elected Adam as high priest. And any thoughts on that, Eric? I, I don't understand how you would get that from scripture without right. an older theistic evolution worldview influencing you to try to figure out how to create something like that out mm. of scripture. I, 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 you can't read Genesis. If, if you had, if you spoke Hebrew and read the Hebrew Bible, you would not come away with that idea. Right. How come nobody came away with that idea for the last 2000 years? How come even writings pre Jesus did not come away with this idea that Michael is trying to espouse He's actually trying to incorporate an idea from Michael Heiser and others to try to create this, this concept. Um, how, how come that wasn't around for that long? How, how did how did we miss that? Um, it's not consistent with Scripture. Genesis chapter 2 is very clearly, specifically honing in on day 6 of creation, which, fix, which, which fits a, a Hebrew style of writing very well. You give big picture, summary statement, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Then you go into more detail. Okay, he did it in six days, and on the seventh day he rested, and here's what he did on each day. Then you go into even more detail. Here's the whole point of me writing to you. Let me tell you about day number six when God made man. Right. This is what is special. So you see Genesis 1, 1, big picture. The rest of Genesis 1 through Genesis 2, 3 is overview of what how God did it. And it's not just that God did it. Because I like Andy Stanley's like, it's not about how. It's just about the fact that God did it. Well, why would he give us so many details on how if it's not about how? How he did it. He spoke this into existence first, then he spoke this into existence next, then he did this, then he made the sun, moon, and stars, then he did this. So it talks through all that. And then he hones in on what it's really all about. Now, here's what the whole rest of this book is going to be about. We're focusing on man. 
God's chief creation. And when you read it like this, it makes perfect sense. So I don't understand how you would come up with that idea. I don't understand where that concept would even come from. It's an invented idea to try to help out this narrative of allegory or to try to help out, oh, look at these ancient Near East myths. Let's tie this to those. They were being allegorical. Let's tie this and create an allegory that we can use. It just doesn't fit the scripture. Amen. It, it's, as you said, it's never been interpreted that way. Genesis 2 can't be about election. You've pointed out a few times, Adam's the first man. He was literally made out of the dust of the ground. Eve is the mother of some living, no, all living, clearly speaking to uh, humans. Eve was literally made from his side, is what the Bible said. And so how can this only be about election when the language screams of uh, creation? It, it, uh, maybe you've heard more arguments against that. I, I, I need to do a PowerPoint on that one. So I no, can you actually did <laughs> step us through there and actually see, okay, what are the scriptures that go against that? Because I'd have to stop and go, okay, well, how many scriptures are against this idea of Adam? Just, I mean, you think about, you know, the, the whole idea of sin came after sin came death. So, well, okay, Adam is elected and then Adam screws it up. He sins and now he just... You mess up the whole point of scripture. You mess up doctrine. You mess up salvation. The very need for Christ is now done away with. What, what was he dying for? If not to save us from the penalty of death. You made a good point in, in the debate on this issue. You pointed to Exodus 20. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is and rested the seventh day. So how can there be a day eight? with this election event, when everything, including Adam and Eve, everything means everything, was created in, in those six days. It doesn't work. I, again, it's you, you have to want to force an exterior, an, ex, an outside, a, a, an exterior idea, something that is, is not part of the scripture, into the scripture, in order to get that very concept you're not starting with scripture to get that concept. You're starting with something extra biblical and saying, hey, let me see if this will fit into the Bible. Right. And that is doing the same thing that Hugh Ross, that, that, I, that I asked that question to Hugh Ross about. Is the Bible the authority or is something extra biblical the authority? You know, which one is the authority? And I like your slides earlier. You actually showed there were a couple little um uh, uh, small sections where a couple people said ages of time. And if you actually look at the ages of time, you'll actually find that those don't go millions of years. They're very short periods of time. Like Usher's chronology has six ages of time that lead up to Christ. And then there were some people that believed that the ages were just 1000 years and they go, well, okay, maybe the days of creation were that. Well, that surely isn't evolution either. You only have a 14,000 year old earth now. It's still really right. young. So it, it, I think that's a very valid, you, Mike, you're, I mean, Matt, you're hitting it on the head there. Uh, sorry, this is the first time we've met. Okay. I got, um, so Matt, you, uh, you're hitting the nail on the head there because, okay, let me grant you a couple thousand years. Let me grant you, let me, I mean, I even grant the evolutionists the millions of years and say evolution can't happen. Like it doesn't matter how theistic evolution, we, guys, we haven't even touched the whole idea of evolution. Could evolution actually happen? Like, mm -hmm. the answer is a resounding no. It, there's no way evolution could have happened. And I mean, so you got the, the negative cases against evolution happening, the positive cases for intelligent design. You've got the, the, the fact that we have so many symbiotic relationships, animals and plants that need each other. And the theistic evolution worldview spreads all those out into plants and then animals and it's slowly evolving. Now you got these all, all these indeterminate relationships that are that need each other, these symbiotic relationships that one can't live without the other. Okay, well, which one evolved first? Six day creation makes sense of it. They were created a day apart. No big deal. God did it. It's a supernatural work. So you, you end up having enormous problems from a scientific perspective. And we've only been looking at the biblical so far. This, this is ignoring all the if you took all the ways to show the age of the earth. And, and had all of them lined up. Here they are. 95% of them would show that it's young. 5% would show that it could be old. 
Right. And I would object to the word old. I would instead say, listen, this shows that it's a mature creation. Mature. When God made Adam at one hour old, he did not look one hour old. God did not give Adam a shovel and hand him a couple seeds and say, plant these. You're going to be hungry soon. Okay. <laughs> That's not the way God did it. God created a mature, fully functioning creation. So right. anyway, we can, how, how many different, you know, we're going to cover everything by the time we're done with this show, if we keep going. <laughs> well, you nailed it because it's not like God created Adam as a zygote or a baby. Right. No, he, he created him mature and ready to do the work that's necessary. And a better, a, another question is evolution compatible with science? No. Is evolution compatible with scripture? No. And we could talk all day about that evidence. And th there's a criticism in the chat I wanted to pull up. Zach Hancock, appreciate it. He says, only if we read the scripture very rigidly, a story can be true without being literally true. Example, parables. But we spoke earlier, Eric. No, it's not wooden literalism. We are interpreting scripture literarily, as in we are recognizing yeah. the existence of parables, the existence of metaphors. We are looking at the context. And you pointed out earlier from Genesis, that's literal history. The Vav consecutive yeah. and this and that. And so we understand that we're dealing with literal history where with a parable, we're dealing with, with a parable. If it's uh, something poetic, we understand that as well. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, uh, Eric, my brother? Yeah, you, he, he's, he's right. And what you're saying is so true. When we say we interpret the, the scripture literally, we do not um, we do not believe that the trees of the fields had hands that were clapping. OK, right. that's that's not what we mean. We mean we interpret scripture as it is supposed to be interpreted. And this is where context actually matters. Context is a big deal. OK, context, context, excuse me, makes a, makes a big difference. So um, when you think about the different types of literature in the Bible, here's what we actually have. You have historical literature. You have poetic literature. You have wisdom literature. You have prophecy. You have the epistles. And you have apocalyptic, what's coming in the future. Here's what's never part of history, science fiction and myth. And yet the very thing that many people are trying to do is, oh, well, you take the Bible literally, and I take Genesis 1-1. It was just a myth. No, absolutely not. You don't get that genre in the Bible. It doesn't exist. Context, every single time, Context is king. I love this one. What's that middle letter right there? What is that? It's a B, A, B, C. Okay, now <laughs> what is it? Oh, well, now it's a 13. Context is king. And when you look at the word yom in the, uh, in the Old Testament, it, it almost every single time means a 24-hour day. Very few exceptions. Now, anytime, anytime it's used with evening or morning or a number, it is always 100% of the time a 24-hour day without any exception. And even though that's the case, they still want to say that, oh, well, in Genesis 1, those are exceptions, even though it's got evening, morning, and the number. It's got all three. And they say that it's an exception to the rule. It's not really a day. So those are the ways that it's uh, interpreted. And it appears nine times in Genesis 1 with one of these rules. So you get uh, rule number one, evening and morning on 24 hour day. That's used 19 times. Rule number two, morning with evening as defined as a 24 hour day. That's 38 times outside of Genesis one. Rule number three, yom with a number defined as a 24 day. That happens 359 times. And then rule number four, yom with night as defined as a 24 hour day. And that occurs 53 times. So it's, uh, sorry, it's uh, context is king. And all the literature of the Bible does not give us any mytho history. We do not get that there. We got history, poetry, wisdom, prophecy, epistles, uh, and apocalyptic. So those are your options. And if you think Genesis 1-1 is some kind of myth, that is not from the Bible. <laughs> that is great. That's a great answer. Matt, did you have something to say there? I was just going to say, how would you answer um, the people that say, well, there was no sun, so therefore it couldn't have been a 24-hour day for the first day and maybe second day? Hmm. Great question. And I, we do get this a lot. Hey, if you don't have the sun, sun's not there till 
till day number four. So you can't have anything without the sun. You can't have a day without the sun. I go, hold it, hold it, hold it. What is necessary for a day to exist? Full rotation of the planet. Exactly. And a lot of people get confused about this. We know what a year is. A year is the earth orbiting the sun. Right. So you do have to have the sun or a central point to have a year. A day, that's just one rotation of the earth. Whether you have a sun or not, a day is one rotation of the earth. We know in the beginning, God said, let there be light. So there was light. We do not know the source of the light. I believe the source was purposefully not the sun on purpose because God did not want people to worship the sun. That's what the Egyptians were doing. They were worshiping the sun gods. And, and, and Moses comes along through the, the, the wisdom of God and records, no, 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 sun didn't even come first. God is the giver of light. And that's the way he really did it. God made light first. Mm. And, <clears throat> excuse me, God. Uh, Eric, you've earned a drink of water, brother. You've done great. <laughs> <laughs> we've been, how long have we been going here? We've been um, going for an hour and a half. Time's flying by with you. Dude, uh, so, so you don't need the sun in order to have a day. All you need is a rotation of the earth and a light source. And those existed at the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and, the, and God said, let there be, you guys know the next word? And God said, let there be, you guys, pop quiz. Light. Yeah. <laughs> and there was light. So you had everything necessary to have a day at the very beginning. Amen. I also find in the book of Revelation, it says that um, God is um, cleansing everything and the sun and moon will be gone. It'll be uh, evaporated. But yet we know that there's going to be days in the Sabbath in the next life. So it will go back to that original creation again, like you were talking about with the animals, the original creation, how it was designed. Pretty amazing. Yeah. You don't have the sun. Now that is amazing, isn't it? That's pretty cool. We're going to have a light you, source that is not the sun. Yeah, you made that point in the debate. You did an excellent job. I guess I'll show my slide here because this is the verse you use. Revelation 21, 3. And the city, speaking of the city, had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it for the glory of God did lighten it. And who? The lamb is the light thereof. And you made that point in the debate. You also did a good job correcting IP on the rotation of the earth. And really, I think, just sufficiently answered that objection. Um, a point you just made that I think is awesome is that the true God, he made plants before the sun, and therefore, who do we worship? We worship God and not the sun, rather than the pagans, who, like the Egyptians, look to the sun as a deity, and so they worship the sun rather than the one true God. Okay. Well, Eric, as, as we start to wind things down here, I really appreciate your time because I know how busy you are and the audience is just loving it. We got a ton of positive feedback. We got some good, uh, we got a good mix, skeptics, non-skeptics. And so I do encourage people to uh, share this content around. I got a real short clip from your debate and this is your response to his subdue argument. And I think you made just a really good point. And I just wanted to uh, showcase it for, for the audience. So I'm going to play it right here. Maybe, gentlemen, give me the thumbs up if it's coming in as I, as I click it. So here we go. Three, two, one. Yeah, you're reading backwards to Genesis rather than reading from Genesis forward. And anybody who does that is going to make the same exact mistake you do. You're going to read, <laughs> subdue, and have dominion over as the way it is now in a fallen world rather than putting that verse before the fall and realizing what it was before the fall. If there were no thorns and thistles in creation until the fall of man, well, then it's a totally different world. Uh, we're, we're not going to see the same things that we see in the post-fall world, in the pre-fall world, when God made this world very good, when it was perfect, when there was no sin, no death, no disease, no thorns, and no thistles. Amen. Slam dunk. Eric, can you reiterate the importance of what you just said in terms of logic, biblical hermeneutics, you know, not interpreting backwards where he's taking that word subdue and then assuming that it necessarily means the exact same thing in the context of what? The pre-fallen world. Yeah. I mean, you got to go, go and, going back to scripture again. It's not until Genesis chapter three 
that we read about the fall of man. And over and over and over, people make this grave mistake of taking all this, all this is after the fall, and then reading all of this as though it's the exact same as this back here, Genesis chapter 1 and 2. It is not the same. You, and this, this is why we have old earth creation and why we have theistic evolution. Because they are reading all of this as, as, well, look at the fallen world here, and they're reading this in the same context as this. And we got to change. This, a dividing line right here, chapter 3, draw a line in your Bible. Different. Everything's different now. It's a whole different place now. Something changed. Creation is cursed. It's groaning and travailing together in pain now. Everything is cursed. The serpent is cursed. I love the way you brought up. It's cursed more than the other beasts of it. They're cursed as well. Right. Everything is cursed now. So you have to draw a dividing line right there and say different. So when he reads all these words subdue, I forgot that I said all that, by the way, in the debate. So thanks for playing that. <laughs> um, when he reads all these words subdue and reads that back into Genesis chapter 2, it's like Genesis chapter 1. Is that 2 or 1? In, end of 1 or beginning of 2? Uh, subdue the earth. Very good. Every green hemp food. Fill the earth. Have dominion. Chapter 1. Um, so when you're reading all those words back to chapter 1, you got a problem because now you're dealing with a cursed world. They weren't dealing with a cursed world. Exactly. I mean, you could take the substance like electricity and use it for something bad or use it for something good, powering a hospital. Just like a king can subdue in a harsh, evil way or in, in a good way like Adam and Eve were commanded to do before the fall in the garden. I need to say what I did not want to do, because I'm not a textual critic. I was not ready to go into that debate and go, okay, let's take all these verses that he's going to give from subdue and take this subdue and go in. So I would like to study that out more. That's why I said earlier, I really need to come up with some slides on that to go, okay, what is this saying? What's the context? What does it mean? What is right. this saying? What's the context? What, is, what does it mean? Because uh, it's really frustrating to hear Michael very quickly dismiss. Oh, well, all the, you know, the ancient, you know, uh, the, um, uh, the, the church fathers, they believe this. And he just kind of, he says it as though it's true. And people are like, oh, well, I, I guess it's true. When you right. actually look it up, which I, I did, I'm like, nothing could be further from the truth. This is wrong. This is misrepresenting the church fathers. It's, it's anyway, we went through that. But so I want to do that with the word subdue because I haven't done it specifically with that word. But uh, yeah, I guess that wasn't a bad answer. That was a great answer. So, uh, Eric, as, as we uh, wind down here, let me sneak in a couple audience questions. Maybe we could have you on again in the future just for an audience Q&A because, wow, we've got a lot of audience questions. I'll just sneak in one or two. I want to respect your time. Yeah, this has been a great show. You put a lot of work into this. I really appreciate your slides. And you've provided us, not only Matt and I and our team, but the audience with very thorough answers to, to these objections that are really just popping up everywhere from theistic evolutionists and old earth creation. So this is a good question. It's a common one. You've debated this many times too, Eric. So Doki Doki Bible Club, appreciate it, brother. His question is, is there allowance in the Bible to make Noah's flood rather than a global flood, worldwide flood, a localized flood? Hey, thanks for the question. Doki Doki, is that how you say it? Yes. <laughs> I'm telling you, some people, I, I never understood screen names. I mean, you'll have to forgive me. I'm, I'm like, I'm a millennial. I'm, I'm right there. I'm just in the millennial camp, but I'm like, I don't, some things just never caught on with me. So uh, anyway, <laughs> doki doki. I like the Bible club part. That's, I, I get that. I understand that. But uh, no, unfortunately, there's no way, there's no allowance in the Bible <clears throat> to make it a local flood. Uh, I actually, I've got a, a, a presentation I do. You can watch it on our YouTube channel or go to our website, creationtoday.org and just type in literal global flood. I asked the question, was it a literal global flood? And we go through the Bible and we go through science. No way according to the Bible was it a local. No way according to science was it local. The Bible says all the high hills were covered. All flesh died. Everything died. I mean, read Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8 and just read them asking yourself the question, is it trying to communicate a local or a global flood? All the high hills were covered. Every beast under the whole heaven you will never come away with a local flood idea from scripture, let alone science. I go to the Grand Canyon. I take 50 people on a tour of the Grand Canyon every year. Going to be going in June this year. 
creationtoday.org slash Grand Canyon. A little plug. Um, so we go every year. You look at these layers to the earth and we show you things. It's impossible to say that these were not laid down by massive amounts of water that covered the entire globe. We show you not only Grand Canyon, you see a mile down into the earth. We show you how, and we go through the sediment that used to be on top of the Grand Canyon. There, there used to be almost two miles of sediment on top of Grand Canyon. Like when you're standing on the top, looking down on the bottom, all the way up there, 7,000 feet above sea level, there used to be another two, almost two miles of dirt that's gone for tens of thousands of square miles. Only a global flood can, can make sense of that. Nothing else makes sense of that. So, oh, I did a movie on this. You can watch it for free, grandcanyonmovie.com, grandcanyonmovie.com. You can movie. pull it up and watch, watch my whole, I was there at the Grand Canyon. I did on-the-street interviews uh, like Ray Comfort and the guys asking how did this happen, and then I used the science of the canyon to lead to the scripture and salvation. So really cool video I did. Amen. I watched that video. Great job. I also loved your night at the museum one. That was a lot of fun too. <laughs> Very crazy. Uh, you're, you're a great actor, you know, you versus Ben Stiller. I don't know. That would be a oh, tough one. You man. both did a good job in your own ways. Dude, <laughs> the gotta way get that, I, I'm still not sure what I think about this movie. Okay. Uh, night <laughs> at the creation museum, by the way, you can watch it for free on my website, creationtoday.org slash movies, creationtoday.org slash movies. Uh, I remember this was supposed to be just a video blog, a vlog. I was going to go through with Tim Chafee and like, oh, tell me about that. We got, we had all night there. I was like, hey, Ken, can I have the museum at night? Nobody will be there. Can we just kind of do whatever we want? He's like, yeah. Well, a friend of mine that had helped me produce the Creation Today show several years ago was like, we got to make a movie. And I'm like, no, that sounds like a whole lot of work. No way. She lives in Oregon. She said, I bought my ticket. I'll meet you guys in uh, in Tennessee or in Kentucky at the creation museum. Uh, in, and I was going to be, I was going to be there in two weeks doing this little vlog. She ends up writing a basic script all night long. We ended up writing and filming over, over one night on a cell phone and produced night at the creation museum. So for, for what it, for what it took to produce it, I'm blown away. Yeah. I'm still not sure what I think about it, but I got to tell you, I did go all out. This was me going, okay, I'll, I'll give it my best. So that was, that was my best. You did good. I, I'd nominate you for an Academy Award, brother. So <laughs> <laughs> right up there with Ben Stiller, you guys oh, can duke it out for it. So uh, Doki Doki, I appreciate it. So there's your Grand Canyon movie. There's the uh, Creation oh, yeah. Museum movie. So I do recommend both. And real quick, if I could add, because the local, and you did a great job answering it, uh, Eric. The local flood idea is kind of humorous to me because, firstly, why would you build an ark the size of an ocean liner, take two of every air-breathing land animal, including birds, for a local flood that you knew was coming? Why not just move? And I've, I've studied that the, there's a certain bird species. So you definitely don't need birds. There are birds that migrate from Alaska to Hawaii, I believe it is. There's no land in between. And they travel 3,000 miles without taking a single break. And so why bring birds onto the ark if it was just local? Just have them migrate and fly away. And it just, th <laughs> these points don't make any sense to me, right? It, and I, I did not mention any of those, but that is, a, that is so relevant. And again, ask yourself, why would somebody take the scripture and say, hey, Maybe this was just a local flood. What's the reasoning behind even presenting the idea? Mm. The reason behind it is, well, if all the layers were formed over millions of years and those weren't from, formed from the, from the global flood, well, then it couldn't have been a global flood. It's got to be a, a local flood. The very reason to add this or interpret the Bible this way, that it was just a local flood, the only reason to do that is because of old earth and evolution. Only reason. It's not old. Evolution didn't happen. Why compromise? Once again, what you said earlier, a perfectly good book that's never been proven wrong with a theory of evolution or old earth that has not been proven right. Amen. Well said. Well, Eric, I'll get one last skeptic question in here because I do appreciate all the skeptics showing up for this show because it's about planting seeds. It's about winning souls. And then we'll wrap it up, Eric, because you've given us so much of your time and you've been very generous. So, Okay, here we go. Mr. Anderson, good question here. And so he's wondering, Eric,
Is it possible for your interpretation of Genesis to be wrong, but at the same time, it doesn't necessarily undermine the credibility of God? Is it possible for God and evolution to both be compatible? Well, uh, Mr. Anderson, great question. Uh, I'll tell you this, according to the atheists that I know that I, that I have interviewed and I shared several, I, I don't remember if I shared all of theirs in the debate, but uh, I got several atheist friends that would say it is not possible, not possible to have God and evolution together. The whole point of evolution is you don't need God. Mm. I think apologia. Uh, who's up in Canada, has a YouTube channel called, uh, 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 that's his YouTube channel, Paul, Paul Gia, Paul Ends. Right. And uh, he says, no, it doesn't make any sense to try to combine God and evolution together. I mean, think about it. Wouldn't that be a dumb God? I mean, I, I'm not trying to be flippant here. <laughs> evolution says it's blind, random chance that finally goes from the single-celled organism. We don't know where it came from. We don't know where life came from. But to go from this thing to what we are now, blind, random chance processes, no direction, no intelligence. What kind of a God would use that process? A dumb God. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible knows it all, designed it all. I mean, people that make fun of God, I'm like, or, or and, and of creation and of his design, I'm like, how much universe design experience do you have? You're, you really think you're a little bitty 20-year-old, 30-year-old, 40-year-old, 70-year-old, or however many years you got? You really think your brain is capable of understanding and designing an entire universe, and yet you mock the God who did that? There's no excuse for you. And that's exactly what Scripture says. There's no excuse for you. That is willful ignorance. That is somebody who says, I don't want God to exist, and I know why. And I got another good friend, Bill Cluck, atheist, uh, who's on the Christian uh, Christian Atheist Book Club. And he's like, yeah, I, I, I do all kinds of stuff that I shouldn't do according to the Bible. We get right down to what it's really about. I don't want to believe in God. So is it possible that my interpretation of Genesis to be wrong and it not undermine the credibility of God? And Assuming wrong, meaning evolution could be part of it. No way. That is not the God of the Bible who created everything right the first time. If I'm wrong about the interpretation, and it is God who created through evolution, that is not this God. It's not the God of the Bible. So no, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot add evolution and the Bible together. Well said. Excellent answer. I love it, Eric. Okay, uh, Mr. Anderson, thank you for... The question, I'll, I'll just add, you know, I love the verse, 2 Peter 3, in the last days, there's, there's going to be scoffers. What are they going to be denying, Eric? They're going to be denying the, the creation, creation, special creation, the flood, flood, the world that then was, being overflowed with water that perished, and the coming judgment. judgment. Are all three of those events not universal? God created everything, special creation. Coming judgment by fire is not just going to be, you know, coming to a local, local. city near you. <laughs> so why are we going to take the middle event that the skeptics deny and say, well, that was local, but the other two were global. There's no justification logically, hermeneutically. I had not heard it put like that, Donnie. That's really good. That's really good. <laughs> Least I can do. So, uh, okay. Well, Matt, you've been a great co-host tonight, brother. This has been just an excellent show to the audience. I appreciate all the engagement, all the questions, all the feedback. I appreciate all the skeptics and non-skeptics that of course have joined us. Matt, did you have any final words, final thoughts, anything you'd like to add? Um, I guess we can always go to the simplistic view of what's known as Occam's razor. You know, sometimes the, uh, we go to the most simple things and, and scripture is made uh, originally for people that were very simple. And, uh, you know, people couldn't, a lot of people even couldn't read at the time. So they were given scripture, they could understand it. And it, yet people want us today to believe that it's so complicated. We only figured it out. Only one person over here in this random corner figured out that everyone else was wrong this entire time. And we just got to trust the scientists today because yeah, yeah, it'll change, but they're still right. Anyway, you know, forget the Occam's razor thing. Just throw it out the window. We need to go deep into this and, and convolute it as much as possible to understand it. it. Just doesn't make good sense. What's the most parsimonious explanation? The Bible says, Eric, as you've pointed out, Adam's the first man. Eve's the mother of all living. Adam was created out of the dust. Eve from his side. 
wh where's ancestry with the great apes? Where's uh, humans and chimpanzees supposedly related through common ancestry? No, we have separate ancestry, independent origins, and special creation. Maybe we should just believe what the Bible says because that's what it clearly indicates to us. So, Matt, appreciate it. Eric, appreciate you joining us. Very comprehensive. Excellent work and job on your slides and your presentation. I'm going to hand it to you. Any final words, final thoughts? Hey, thank you guys for letting me just be a part of it. Guys, my final thought is same as I concluded in the debate. Hey, listen, at the end of the day, you and I are going to die. Mm -hmm. 10 out of 10 people die. I'm going to try to make it the last thing I ever do, but, but it's going to happen, okay? I'm going to have to do that at some point. When you die, you're going to meet God. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment is coming. And you will be judged for how you behave here on earth. So why don't you go ahead and find out how you're going to do on judgment day? He's going to judge you by his perfect law. Let's just go through a few of his perfect laws, the Ten Commandments. How many lies have you told in your whole life? If you deny lying, I'm going to call you a liar, okay? <laughs> what do you call somebody who tells lies? You're a liar. I'm a liar. You judge yourself here. Don't let me judge you. Judge yourself. How many times have you taken something that doesn't belong to you? Downloaded music illegally. Stole something from a friend. A piece of gum. The value doesn't matter. It's the, 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 the act that matters. How many times have you taken the name of the God that gave you life and used it to curse or to swear and use God's name in vain? How many times have you looked with lust? Jesus says looking with lust is the same as adultery. And, and the Bible says he's not going to hold you guiltless. The, the, the penalty is death. And you say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would God give me such a, a big penalty for such a petty crime? See, you and I misunderstand who the God of the Bible is. If I lie to my 16-year-old son, Jordan, what are my consequences? Nothing. He can't do anything to me. If I lie to my wife, what are my consequences? Rut row, some of you know, okay? <laughs> if I lie to a police officer, what are the consequences? Bigger consequences. If I lie to a judge on the bench while I'm under oath, what are my consequences? Bigger consequences. The crime is the same in each scenario, but who I've lied to has changed. And the Bible says, you and I have not sinned just against each other. Our sins are against God. David, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba, rent his clothes and said, God, against you and you alone have I sinned. Your sin, my friend, your lying is not just no big deal. It's against the creator of the universe. And you need to metanoia. You need to change your mind about your sin. That's where we get the word repent. Change your mind about how you were thinking. Repent of how you were thinking. Your sin is before God and God alone. And yes, you do deserve an eternity in hell because it wasn't a finite sin, a finite crime. It was an eternal crime. Your lies are to God. Your adultery is before God. Your blasphemy is to God. He says he'll, he'll not hold him guiltless who take his name in vain. No thief will inherit the kingdom of heaven. He will not, um, and uh, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Now listen, if you were judged by God's perfect law on judgment day, would you be innocent or guilty of breaking his laws? I hope you're honest and you'd say guilty. I, guilty. Therefore, what do we deserve? Do we deserve heaven or hell? I hope you'd be honest with yourself and say, I do deserve hell. Next question is, does that concern you? And I hope and I pray that it does. It should concern you. It is a very real place. I mean, people say, ah, it doesn't concern me. I don't believe in hell. And I say, well, go stand in the road and don't believe in trucks. <laughs> That's not going to do a lot of good, is it? Well, you ignoring something that is true, something that exists, doesn't make it go away. When you stand before God, you will be judged. You will be found, just like me, guilty. And you do deserve the punishment of hell. Now, if that concerns you, I've got some great news. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ really did come. He died on a cross, lived the life that you and I should have lived, and then died the death of the cross, was buried, and three days later rose from the grave after prophesying his very own resurrection, conquering sin and conquering death, and said, hey, anybody who repents and trusts in me can be saved. I'll grant them everlasting life. I'll forgive them. My blood that we shed on the cross will cover their sins. A legal transaction took place. And God said, if you repent and trust, my blood will cover your sin as well. If you've never repented and trusted in Christ, 
You need to do that today. The Bible says, behold, today is the day of salvation. If you don't understand this truth, I record it in detail as a free gift for you. Creationtoday.org slash gift. Creationtoday.org slash gift. G-I-F-T. And I just want you to understand the gift that God is giving you. So my conclusion is if you're not really saved, you need to repent and trust in Christ today. Why don't you do that today? You can do it through prayer. Talk to God and say, God, I'm sorry. I don't deserve forgiveness. I want your grace and I want your mercy in my life. I accept you. Why don't you make Christ the Lord of your life today? So my final encouragement is trust God. It's true. Everything you wrote is true from beginning to end. There's more coming in this life and the next. Hope you're ready for it. This has the answers. God bless. Amen. God bless. Very powerful. One of the best endings to a show we've had on this channel. Nothing more important than the gospel. Nothing more important than winning souls. It's not always about winning arguments. It's about winning souls, preaching the gospel. And so, wow, that was great, uh, Eric. I appreciate your energy, your knowledge, your enthusiasm. And so God bless you. God bless what you're doing over at Creation today. I love all the work that, that you're doing, the content you're putting out. Uh, Matt, Appreciate you co-hosting, my brother. Time has flown by. It's been a comprehensive show. Rewatchable. I'll, I'll definitely be going uh, back through this again. And to the audience, thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate the feedback. I appreciate how uh, engaged everybody is. So, okay, we're going to wrap things up. God bless all. And thank you for tuning in. Standing for Truth is out.